Hey guys, I'm only here, finally back again. Managed to get Greg back in the co-host seat. I know I said, it's like it's been a little while. Um, I said I was going to do these season one reviews like a long time ago and I didn't. Um, I got really busy with work um, and I got really sick for a little bit while I was off work, which like, why is that? always happening kind of really sucks but anyway we're back and we're going to be unpacking today on this episode of tea in the ton finally we're going to be unpacking season one episode one diamond of the first water so i guess i had never ever heard of bridgerton before i watched season one i did not even know it was a book series i had no idea about it and so I guess like this season really did get me into it as a whole. Um, but I have to say like Simon and Daphne's story is not one of my favorite ones. I think like, I'm, mm, I think for obvious, I think there's some obvious flaws with the story that we're going to get to as we go through. I don't mind how season one was told overall. Like I think, um, like in some ways the storytelling is a lot better than season one he's looking at himself in the in the camera he thinks he looks really handsome um in a lot of ways i think like season one was told a little better than season two um but we'll get to that we'll get to all of that we might i don't know there's a lot to unpack i guess so let's let's dive in our tea today is it's called blue mountain tea in australia we have a shop called t2 got a whole lots of different kinds of tea but this is why why would you do that this is basically a twist on french earl grey which is my favorite tea and i know no one cares about the tea at all but you know here we are i like tea so just gives me something to do with my hands why are you being like this already are you just trying to embarrass me i'm just like like having a child i would assume i don't have any so yeah, this series opens surprise like on London. Surprisingly enough, it does not open on the Bridgertons. Great figure. It opens on on a show called Bridgerton. Imagine that. Wouldn't that have been wild? It opens on the Featherington. Just gonna glitch up a little bit, babe. Um, it opens on the Featheringtons, actually. And it's kind of, I don't really get this. Well, I, like, I get why they did it just for storytelling purposes. But I also, like, I really don't get it. Because it's, it, well, it's not really implied to us. It's shown to us that all three girls, all three Featherington girls, are debuting in the same season. Which is really odd. Because Prudence seems like she would have to be at least three or four years older than Penelope. If we're imagining Penelope's old enough to debut, she must be about 17. Um, so why they've waited to 21, I don't know if it's related to their financial situation. I can't imagine it is because Portia, Lady Featherington, isn't aware of their financial situation. So I really don't understand the point of this. And I don't understand it even further when you consider that then we're told in season two and like I am going to be bringing up things from season two as I do these things because I feel like there's like minor little inconsistencies with the way that the stories are being told and like now I know season two and like what it's like I can't really it's really hard for me to distance it I guess so like there, yeah, there are going to be elements of that in it um I can't help myself I guess is where I'm going with that but like we're then told that Portia is the same age as Mary Sharma. Doesn't really make sense unless, and we don't know the timeline on when she left England, how old Kate was. We don't know the timeline on like when Edwina was born. If you've read The Viscount Who Loved Me, Edwina was a little bit of an oops baby. Um, if you've done the maths on that one like I have, but regardless, so... I don't know. I don't understand why they're all debuting. This is, I've already, I promised myself I was going to keep this episode really brief because my gardener is probably going to be here soon and I don't really want that in the background. But oh God, oh God, that made me sound so waspy, I promise. Um, what, what are you doing? What is this? He's like, 
there. No. So then, then we pan across the square and we see the Bridgertons. Now, everyone's kind of running around. We're all getting ready because Daphne's going to debut today. We don't even see Daphne until like we've already seen everyone else. Eloise is hollering like a fishwife. And it kind of just, it gives us like a really good, it, and they did the exact same thing in season two. It's like a really good, um, it's like a really good um, initial display of like what all the dynamics are, you know? Like we know what everyone's up to pretty much right off the bat there. Get rid of that. Um, so immediately, you know, Daphne comes downstairs. We see that there's something, you know, Eloise and this Penelope, whom we've just seen, they're friendly, they get into the carriage and they go. And already we're noticing, like, there's a little bit of tension in this family, even though they do seem quite happy. Um, because, uh, you know, Violet, their mother, immediately asked Benedict, like, where, where's your brother? Like, if he wants us to all... Um, you know, like obey what he wants us to do as Lord Bridgerton, he's got to be here. And we see immediately what Antony's up to. He's fucking against a tree. <laughs> it's a really, it's an interesting um, introduction to him as a character. And it is, you know, obviously the height of romance. He's checking his watch in the middle, like, be still my beating heart. He's got somewhere to be. And he makes it an excellent time because he arrives right on time. <laughs> oh no like he arrives at the palace right on time we don't i'm so sorry this is spiraled i'm out of practice now as if i was ever in practice if these videos were ever good um they're not going to be this week i'm so sorry so he you know that the bridgertons are all there and uh, Daphne's kind of like, oh, you're here, Antony. And he's like, well, yeah, why wouldn't I be? Like, this is a super important time for our family. And you can kind of see that they feel this is like a relaunching of their family or a, like a launching of their family. Because to be honest, even though they're pretty rich, the Bridgetons have a lot of daughters to marry off. And like the eldest one in this day and age had a lot of pressure on that because if Daphne marries up, you know, she's the daughter of a Viscount. If she marries up to, you know, an Earl, a Duke, the Viscount is very low on the ranks of nobility. I think there's only Baron and Baronet, like, under that. Um, if she marries up, then all the other girls will also be able to marry up, you know? Like, you've got to make a good match. And she's setting the standard for her family in a way as she tells... Eloise later on so they're all very excited about this and Violet's just kind of already you can feel the tension between her and Antony and she's just kind of like yeah well you're late babe where were you and he doesn't say anything they just go inside you know so we're introduced to the queen who is bored as fuck by these proceedings and I feel like this is one of the really interesting things between season one and two which is how, like, Daphne as the diamond is treated this season. So I'm going to pay a little bit of attention to this, I think, because, like I said, I feel like there's a couple of inconsistencies in the writing that aren't quite, like, matched up um, by the writing itself. That doesn't really make sense. But, like, by the plot itself, I guess, is what I mean to say there. Um, so, yeah, the Featheringtons are, um, presented first, all three of them at once, they're presented, and it goes pretty poorly, actually. Everyone you can see kind of pities these poor girls, um, who are being foisted on society by their mother. Um, the Queen's very bored with them, and then Prudence collapses. So, you know, all in all, a win. Yeah, um, that went really well. It's hard to imagine how Portia could have foreseen that going better. Yeah, we're back, baby. We're back to poorly timed sips of tea and a dog who's not paying attention, does not want to be here at all. Isn't it good to see me back? So then Daphne's presented 
and you can immediately tell everyone's a little bit more interested in this family, you know, like everyone's kind of, oh, what's going on here, yeah. The queen calls her flawless, and that's kind of the end of it, you know, like Violet kind of says, like, keep it together, babe, everyone's watching, and that's kind of the end of it. There's no, like, big presentation of her as the diamond. In fact, it's actually Lady Whistledown, as we see in the next scene, that actually calls her a diamond of the first water. The Queen says no such thing. Very interesting to note. Um, yeah, I don't know. So then, then we get like the little opening credits. He's gone. You know, actually he lasted 10 minutes. That's a lot longer than our previous episodes. I'm really proud of you, boo. So if you could fully move off, that might actually be, no, we're just going to select everything. That's great. So then we get the opening credits and I, don't know, I really like the opening credits. I don't understand why they're only in the first episode of each season. Okay. Um, I don't really get that. Um, but after that, we see there's an introduction voiceover, Julie Andrews, Love My Life, to her as Lady Whistledown. And Lady Whistledown's new this, this social season. We've not seen her before. And everyone's kind of very confused, you know? She's talking about how she's gonna be keeping up with the gossip this season. Um, she's gonna be keeping up with the gossip. And you know, sure, okay. Um, that's really, that's kind of, that's fine. Um, she's going to be keeping up with the gossip that, this season. That's fine. Um, and she immediately is kind of talking about all the major players. She's talking about the Bridgertons and she says they're named alphabetically. And I'm going to try and refer to Penelope as different than Lady Whistledown because, um, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the whole series, this is not a spoiler free show. Why are you off it? So, um, but she says that she finds it banal, I suppose, that they're all named alphabetically and Violet's kind of a little bit put out by this immediately. She's like, hell now, like, you know, like, mm, okay, I thought it was cute, but everyone's entitled to their opinion, you know, which, I mean, are they? Why was there any need to comment on that? I just... I, you know, if you've watched my season two recaps, which I can't imagine why you would watch these recaps, if you have not, oh, that's so crooked. Oh, this is a disaster today. Anyway, I can't imagine why you would watch my season two, re my season one recaps if you haven't watched my season one recaps, because honestly, how does anyone even find this channel in the first place? <laughs> Look, it is what it is at this point, but. So she, uh, yeah, 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 what was I even saying? Yeah, okay, she finds it banal. Um, like, why, I'm not a big fan of the Lady Whistledown plot in general, just the way it's used in the show. I'm not really sure there's any huge need for that. Um, but, yeah, it's what it is. Like, I don't, I don't actually write the show, I just watch it. So, She basically, yeah, and everyone's kind of a bit confused. They don't know who this Lady Whistledown is. Portia's a bit annoyed because it, she's expecting a visitor. Um, Lord Featherington has agreed to uh, keep their cousin from the country for the season. Um, she's agreed to do, he's agreed to do that. And so she's a bit stressed because she's going to have four girls to run through this season and Penelope kind of says like, you know, well, if, if you would rather only have three, like I don't have to, I don't have to debut this season. Like I can just do my own thing. And Portia's like, nah, you're doing it. And it's really interesting because um, Penelope obviously knew as I said, I wasn't gonna do this and then here I am. But Penelope, oh, if we don't talk about it now, like when are we gonna talk about it? Um, Penelope obviously knew that Marina, their cousin, was coming and she's kind of used this um, opportunity in Lady Whistledown to be like, oh, well, she says you're only hosting three girls, so maybe you'd like to only host three girls. And she's kind of trying to trap her mum in a way into, into 
letting her get out of this season, which is actually kind of really clever. And I wish I had so many ways to trick my mum. Mum, if you're watching this, obviously I love you dearly. It's just... So she, she, Portia's like a bit stressed. She's annoyed. Um, we see that uh, through this season, I guess, we're going to see that Daphne's obviously really excited to get married. I think like out of all the Bridget and girls, she's the only one that really like sets out to get married. It's hard to say because we don't really see Francesca's first season. I know we're going to see it in season three in the books. We don't really see it, but I think she is really the only one who's genuinely like excited to be at least in the show. It, it differs a little bit in the book. And there are big differences between the show and the book, which I'll run through as I remember. I only ever read The Duke and I once, so I'm a little bit patchy on that. Um, so if I'm wrong, yeah, I don't know, just tell me. But Daphne in the book has had a few seasons. In this, she's obviously just 18. Um, in the book, I believe she's 20, 21 possibly. Um, but she's really excited to get married and we kind of see the immediate difference between her and Eloise who they're introducing us as to as kind of the other main sister though I must say Francesca is in this episode actually quite a bit her most she has her most lines in this episode of the entire series um but she <laughs> she Eloise is kind of already like look I don't know why you're so excited like that girl you know last year someone got married that was supposedly a love match and she hasn't seen the Earl like she lived very far away from him all year they don't really you know like they don't really interact like marriage is not all it's it's cracked up to be basically but and that's kind of the whole I don't know why they invented this kind of dynamic between Eloise and Daphne I guess because they wanted to have we're used to I think in period dramas well, I guess they weren't period dramas when like in the time they were originally written but we're used to wanting to see like a very particular thing from our period dramas in this day and age and this is why I think they made a lot of changes to like the new version of Persuasion which is I watched it last night and like that's an hour and a half of my life I have to get back <laughs> I think like we're used to seeing a very specific type of heroine in these books and what we want to see is a modern girl in that time we don't necessarily want to see someone who's like excited to be on the marriage mat and wants to get married but I think that's like it's a really important perspective to show because I said you know in my reviews of season two I get a little bit annoyed with Eloise's storyline sometimes because I feel like I just want them to show that like true feminism is having the choice to do these things and I feel like they're falling a little bit into this trap of like well feminism is you know, burn our bras and like, and that's fine if that's like what it is to you, that's what you want to do, you don't want to get married, but it's about having the choice to do these things, right? And I get a little bit annoyed because yeah, Daphne doesn't need to get married for money and she is in a really lucky position. And I think that's why it's so hard for us to see Anthony's perspective of all of this and he's very different in the books in that he's just kind of like, if you don't want to get married, don't get married, I don't care. I'm slutting around, you know, like he, he has other issues on his mind as well. So I think that's really interesting, but yeah, basically Daphne's really excited to get married. Eloise is kind of like, this is shit. Um, so then this handsome, mysterious man trots on into town. His name's Simon. And he is the new Duke of Hastings. His father has very recently died. Um, we see because Lady Danbury immediately offers her condolences and we're led to believe the relationship between them was really very fraught, you know? Like, he doesn't really seem to care that his father's dead, neither does Lady Danbury. She didn't care for his father that much either, but they're both kind of like, so we're in this new position. Where Simon has been for the last few years is not exactly made clear to us, honestly. Um... He's been overseas. He's been traveling where we don't know. I imagine in the Americas or some such. I'm not entirely sure. It doesn't really say, but he wants to go there 
He wants to get out of England as soon as possible. He's got absolutely no interest in actually being a present duke. It's a title so far as he sees and he doesn't really want to see it as his. And I think as we come to see later on in the series, next episode, I guess, he sees it very much as his father's title and he feels like if he inhabits this title and he becomes this person, then he's going to become his father in a lot of ways and he doesn't really want to see that. Um, so he's very interested in distancing himself from the whole thing and he immediately tries to get out of Lady Danbury's ball. She's not having it. She's like, you're coming, tough tits, basically. See you tonight. Um, so then we see uh, Anthony. We meet Anthony's mistress, Sienna. As you know, obviously, if you've watched this channel before, my main Bridgertonship is Kate and Anthony all day, every day. I don't dislike the Sienna storyline in season one. I know that's a really unpopular opinion. 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 I'm so sorry. Opinion for a Kate and Anthony fan to have. I realise that. But that being said, and I'm going to talk about it, I might even do a whole episode on the. Let's call it the Sienna Kate paradox. I might even do a whole episode on that just because I feel like. I feel like this storyline, while it wouldn't have necessarily been my first choice, because I do feel like it paints Anthony in a really negative light that wasn't there so much in the books. And don't get me wrong, he is like, he's not perfect in the books. There are some very misogynistic parts of the Viscount Who Loved Me and pretty much every book in the Bridgerton series. But I do think that like this storyline actually doesn't take away from Kate and Anthony's storyline. I think it actually adds to it. And I would actually like to see Sienna back in season three for some closure, but that's not happening. We'll get to that later. So we can see pretty much immediately Sienna's a little bit resentful of the fact that Anthony doesn't really have a lot of time to spend with her. You know, like he looks at his watch. He's pretty much constantly this season looking at his watch and she tells he tells her it's his father's watch um and we can see immediately she kind of resents the um responsibility i suppose he has to his family she sort of resents it a little bit and i think this <sighs> we'll talk about this a little bit more as the series goes through but i don't think I do think he had genuine feelings for Sienna, I really do, at least in the best way that he could at this point in time. You know, I don't think Anthony's really at the point in his life where he's ready to love someone wholly and completely. I don't think he gets there until the end of season two, if I'm honest. And I think that's a journey he's going to continue to go on in later seasons. Um, but I do think he loved her the best way he knew how. Their relationship is a very transactional kind of love, though. And I think, like, she got something from it as much as he did. It was the way he handled it, as we see later on in this episode, later on in the series, was the way he handled it good? No. It was absolutely awful. The toxic masculinity, Jonathan Bailey has talked a lot about how Anthony suffers from top toxic masculinity related to the time period he's in and I think like that is very apt I just their relationship never would have worked because I think what Anthony wants here is truly to escape his responsibilities and that's what he sees Sienna as um an escape more than anything you know like she's looking for a comfortable life he's looking I think there's genuine affection there for sure do I think this relationship ever would have worked no um, but he immediately is the biggest dick on the planet and he says basically like, well, I have to go and I have to chaperone my sister because she needs someone to protect her virtue. Sorry, I just need to get my notes back. She needs someone to protect her virtue. And Sienna's kind of like, mm, well, you know, not every, not all of us have that. And he's like, well, not everyone's a lady. Like, babe. What's wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Are you incapable of being like nice to a human being? <sighs> yes, he is. We know he is. But he, uh, yeah. And then he kind of says, which immediately proves to be false later in the episode, but he's like, you have me to protect you as well. 
She doesn't. She doesn't. He's going to ditch her almost immediately, but, you know, whatever. So we then head off to the Danbury Ball. Anthony has taken it upon himself to fend men off with a stick, you know? Like, this is his family legacy, and he is not going to let it be sullied by gamblers. He is not going to... He's, I think Anthony is really, and it's kind of at odds with how Violet sees him at this point in time, but Anthony is really interested in proving himself at this point. And I think he sees this as maybe his first opportunity to like be responsible and step up and he's not doing a great job at it, obviously. Like we know that he's failing at it. Um, he's not doing a very good job at it, but I think he was, he's pretty desperate to show everyone that he could do this if he wanted, you know? So he's taking this very seriously. He's basically, anyone who looks at Daphne, he's like, get out of here, scum. Which is, it's actually really interesting if you've seen season two. This is exactly how it plays out at Edwina's first ball. It's really interesting, but anyway. So Anthony's fending men off with a stick and Violet, you can tell, is pissed. She's like, can you just get out of here? Like you've had no interest in doing anything. Now you've shown up here like I'm more than capable of getting my child married. Go. Um, Anthony does not buy it, no. Penelope, we immediately see, is in love with Colin. And Colin has no idea because, yeah. And this is something that's going to develop. Obviously, season three is going to be about Penelope and Colin. And as we know, I'm not a huge fan of theirs, but I'm looking forward to possibly being surprised, I guess. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. This brush isn't actually doing anything anymore. I think I'm just stuck in a loop. Um, so... <laughs> Colin is, tr uh, Colin is trying to escape the swarm. No. But Colin does barge in on Marina's dance, which is a totally chill and normal thing to do. Marina's a bit of a success, I guess, at this point. And Portia's getting kind of annoyed because she feels like her daughters are getting overshadowed. Um, so she's getting a bit annoyed at that, I guess. Which is, you know, okay. It's a bit petty. It's kind of what she does. Um, so Simon is trying to escape the swarm of people. Daphne's desperate to escape. Anthony, so she goes to get some lemonade and we're introduced to Nigel Burbrook. No, hate him, awful. And he makes some really weird comments about her and how he's been in love with her since he was a teenager, which would have made her a child at the time, which is, you know, really uncomfortable and weird to have made those comments. Um, he's very different in the books. Like the Burbrooks are kind of like a running joke in the books. In that, like, they're kind of just bumbling idiots, you know? I think Prudence, maybe, or Philippa, one of them actually ends up married to a Burbrook. Um, one of the Featherington girls. Obviously, that doesn't happen. A big, oh, oh, ooh. Um, I'm fine. Obviously, that doesn't happen because of what we see in this series, but, okay. And it's a, it's a true, I think, testament to how desperate... Daphne is away is to get away from Nigel because immediately after being desperate to get away from Anthony, she's now like, oh thank God, I'll just go back to Anthony. Um, so they Simon and Daphne collide and we see there's lots of tension in their eyes already. And Daphne tries the oldest book in the trick uh, the book in the trick. The oldest trick in the book to get away from a man which is by talking to another man because they can't accept that maybe you're just not interested. They do accept the authority of another man. So you immediately try that. We've all been there. Mine at university, his name was Jeremy. He was my best friend from university. Shout out to Jeremy. He's definitely not watching this, but like, you know, maybe. Um, so, <laughs> She, and, and Simon's immediately kind of like, she's kind of like, can you just introduce yourself to me so we can have a conversation and I can get away from this absolute creeper? And he kind of doesn't really believe. He thinks this is a bit of a ploy. He's like, okay, like, if you want to introduce yourself, like, just introduce yourself, but leave me alone kind of thing. He's very fed up with the mums already and he doesn't want to get married. He's not interested. And unfortunately for Daphne, he turns out to be a friend of Anthony's. And it's, I think this is really interesting because it seems that Daphne is like aware of Anthony's reputation because she says a few times in this first episode, basically like the, the fact that you're friends with my brother means that you're the last man 
whom I would ever want to like seek a relationship with, which is, look, honestly, it's probably wise of her. But like part of me is kind of like, you know, what do you think was going on? Put a lot of questions for Daphne. I put a lot of questions for Violet later, <laughs> later in the series, but like, my bird. So they, um, they basically, we're, we're introduced to the fact that um, Anthony and Simon know one another from Oxford. They're very good friends and Anthony didn't know he was back in town. He's looking forward to hanging out with his friend again, which I think is really cute. You know, he like wants to have his bro around. Um, so after that, Anthony's kind of like, we're going to go. We've had enough. And Daphne's kind of like, I want to stay and like meet some cute boys. And Anthony's like, no, you don't want to meet cute boys. You want to go home. Treat them mean, keep them keen, babe. And this is hilarious <laughs> because he's then kind of like, who would know more about courtship than me? Anthony, I've seen season two. You're not good at it. You're not good at it. You shouldn't, Daphne, you should not be taking advice from Anthony about courtship. The man who panic proposed to his sister-in-law. Awful. Like, anyway, so. <laughs> um, then we see then the next morning, we're excited for some callers. We've got a boppy little Maroon 5 number playing, which, cute, you know, everyone's really excited. And Anthony's immediately there like a guard dog, like, hi guys. And we kind of see he's making a bit of a nuisance of himself, despite the fact that Violet is desperate for him to leave. And it's introduced to us, I know I looked confused in season two about where exactly Anthony's living. I don't know why I took note of this today. But he lives across the square, apparently, in his bachelor's lodgings. Cute. Love that for him. Hop, skip and a jump away. So he's popped round and everyone's like, why? You're usually hung over at this point. What are you doing here? And he's like... Fine, here for a short break, Vicky. Couldn't be bothered to make my own this morning. So he, he's there and he's, just, he, essentially he's scaring everyone off. Marina across the, I was gonna say across the hall, across the square is also a big hit. The other Featherington girls, no one's really paying attention to them. Um, and this is obviously really annoying Portia and the more this goes on, the more it gets, you know. And I think, so this is, this is something I don't really get. I'm not sure if I've missed something. I guess I'll find out in my rewatch. But basically then Lady Whistledown starts to be like, well, what's going on? Why is everyone staying away from Daphne? And they're staying away from her because Anthony's being an absolute tyrant. We know that. But it's actually Lady Whistledown that starts drawing everyone's attention to the fact that Daphne is not really getting any suitors. Um, and why she feels the need. I don't understand what this animosity is between Lady Whistledown and the Queen is. Like, I don't understand why she feels this, like, need to do it. Whether it's just, like, a power thing. I don't know. I don't get it. But she basically says, like, oh, the Queen's obviously made a mistake. Like, Daphne's not an incomparable. Like, this is a disaster. And the cracks really start to show, I guess, on Daphne. Because she has, and it's coming up, she sort of calls Anthony on this in a scene or two. And she basically says, like, I've lived my whole life for this moment. This is what I've been training for. Like, I've got a dent. I've learned all of these things. And now, like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I don't know basically like it's not going well and I don't know what to do about it like you're the reason that this is all happening like imagine being in my position and Anthony's immediately like no um, so Daphne wants to ditch Anthony who's proving more difficult to get rid of than chlamydia and which she probably has and Violet's kind of like well we're stuck with it I guess um, and someone else is also proving more difficult to get rid of than an STI in the Regency period is Nigel Burbrook. He's back. And he's now convinced himself that the fact, like Daphne's been waiting for him. No. Everyone finds this completely odious and ridiculous, but they can't really kick him out of their home without causing a bit of a scandal. So we're stuck in it. You know, that's where we're at. Um... <laughs> Colin's calling on Marina. I guess we see he's starting to court her. And I'll go into this later in the season, I think. But, like, I don't really get their relationship. I don't really 
yeah. Um, Simon, we see he's starting to talk. Uh, Letting this all down is also starting to talk a little bit more about Simon. Um, and he, she, she's basically saying that he's declared he's never marry. He'll never marry. And this is kind of oh, that got strong. This is kind of proving to like egg the matchmaking mamas on a little bit, and he's getting a little bit pissy about that. Um, we then see, and this is I've got a point, a little caveat. Is that the right pronunciation? I don't know. I've got a little issue with this next scene, but Simon basically says to Anthony, "We see them at their club. They're hanging out. They're being bros." Cute. Um, he basically says to Anthony, like, well, you've said you'll never marry either. Like, what's your plan? Um, because you're, and he says, this is my issue with it. He says you're the firstborn Bridget of a firstborn Bridget in nine times over. That's actually not correct. Um, because in the books, Edmund Bridgerton is the second born child. He has an older sister, Billy. So not exactly sure. I'm not sure whether we're nixing her in the series. She actually doesn't really come into it. It's just my little, like, that's not true. But basically they're kind of like, and Anthony's like, well, my plan is just to kind of know, like, I don't want to get married. And we see he's in this situation and he gets called on it later, but he basically is not super interested in fulfilling his responsibilities at this point in time. He's not interested in it at all. He just wants to have fun and be a bit of a man about town, which is, you know, that's fine. Um, but I, you know, obviously it plays a bigger role in the season moving forward. <coughs> um, so this next part I think is really interesting because I think I forgot about this, but we see the, the Lady Danbury and the Bridgens at the opera. And Lady Danbury invites Violet and Daphne into her box and she's like, come hang out with me guys. And they go. And then it's kind of like, so Violet and Lady Danbury end up deciding to make a match between Simon and Daphne. Okay, fine. Except for the fact that the reason they've come to this conclusion that they'll be a good match. Now, the reason they've come to this conclusion that they'll be a good match is because Lady Whistledown's talking shit about both of them. For two women, for two fucking women that spend the whole next season talking about how talented they are at matchmaking, you guys got so lucky. Like, I don't think I realised before, like, how little thought they put into it. They didn't see them together. They didn't, like, there's no, they have seen no interactions up to this point. They're just like, so you've got a boy, I've got a girl. Should we just, like... Oh, oh, he's a slut? Well, she's not, but, like, maybe they'll be okay. What? What a wild... Like, that is, I think, less thought than my mum puts in to try to set me up with people, which is... I, no offence to my mum if she watches this video, but it's not a lot. <laughs> Basically, like, you looked at that man once. Perhaps you should. I just... I'm fucking out of it today. I'm so sorry. My makeup looks awful. Um, <laughs> it's fine. I think I'm not actually going anywhere today and it's like four o'clock in the afternoon. I just had a really slow start to the day. I'm so sorry. So they, I mean, they got really lucky. Like this could have ended in absolute disaster and luckily for them, it doesn't. It ends up in very cute children. But like, it could have been bad. It could have been bad, ladies. Like, you're so lucky. And then you decided to try this again next season with even less to go on. <laughs> like, got a lot of thoughts, feelings, and opinions on that. But here we are, you know? So they, they've decided they're going to try and strike a match. And um, they invite Simon to dinner. And Lady Danbury kind of like forces him into this um forces him into this invitation and he says we see him at dinner next and he says he didn't really get much of an option but we see all the Bridgertons together and they're all like really enjoying themselves you know we see the little ones there Gregory and Hyacinth they're having a lot of fun and baby Gregory is so cute like they're so little and cute and I just adorable um 
and we see them, they're all interacting and Violet kind of says like, you know, like we're a really close family, we all really like one another. And then Simon, who's seated next to Daphne, like, Violet has not been very subtle in this at all. But Simon's kind of like, so why aren't you flirting with me? And Daphne's kind of like, because you're a slut. <laughs> like she pretty much just straight up is like, I find you're, you arrogant and I don't, you know, like I, I'm not really interested in you at all. And he's kind of like, good, I'm not interested in you. But Anthony has clocked this. Um, and Daphne kind of says again, like you're Anthony's friend. So I know the kind of man you must be. Daphne, you don't know what sex is. What do you think he's doing? <laughs> like, I guess she knows, like, I, I guess the assumption is she knows what's happening. She doesn't know how it happens, but like, anyway. So she, she, yeah, Anthony realizes this and he's kind of not very happy because he knows Simon and he knows that Simon's not interested in getting married. He's not, and he feels like Daphne's gonna end up getting led on. I bet I, I bet I guess, and this lead ends up in an argument between um, Violet and himself. And this is kind of like where we start to see the beginning of their relationship. And I've said a couple of times before, like I'm not the hugest fan of the Anthony and Violet relationship, particularly this season. I do think they did a good job of pulling it back next season um but i don't think like this season i think there's a few things i'm kind of like what is really going on here but basically anthony says like i don't like this is unacceptable pretty much like why are you trying to make this match between them it won't work it's only going to end in disaster and he's like, for a little bit he's right but like and then violet's kind of like well and it, this i guess is the tension right because he's her child but in this day and age he's technically the head of their family but she kind of calls him on it and says like well you want to be in charge of this but you don't want to be in charge of anything else like you're not taking any responsibility and i do think it's really interesting that this season she's basically like you're a disaster like you're over there with your mistress you're not paying any attention to us and then next season she's really like well why do you think you're failing like because you told him you told him right here in this scene you're a disaster and essentially the implication is that they're like she brings up his father and she says something really interesting which is basically like your father even said like he wasn't interested in marriage edward bridgenham was a virgin before they met and he was like so fucking down to get married if you've read like the little novella about violet i'm not sure why they nixed that i thought it was really cute but anyway bold she says like reformed rakes make the best husband and bold words for a woman whose husband was a total virgin before they met like it's really cute i think um but she basically says like you're failing at everything and we kind of see this is anthony's realization that he needs to stop trying to escape his responsibilities and he needs to take actual care of his family and he does a terrible job at it but she's actually the one and i don't actually think this is true or i wonder if it's true i guess but violet says that at this point Edmund would have made a match for Daphne. Like, keep in mind, we're about two weeks into the season here. And Violet's kind of like, okay, well, basically Daphne needs someone to make her a match. You're not going to do it, so I'm going to do it. And I think it's really interesting that then, like, do I think Nigel Burbrook was a good match for Daphne? Absolutely not. But I do think Anthony kind of got the idea in his head here to do it because Violet told him that that's what his father would, would do. And we're getting, like... <clears throat> Anthony already wants to be Edmund really badly. We can see that from his sideburns, which I'm going to be a huge fan of, but... Anyway, so she basically, she basically says like Edmund would have made a match by now. Like your father would have done what's now necessary is what she says. So he, the very next day we see Anthony, he's decided to take his responsibilities on. Um, and he chooses the exact worst moment to break up with someone, which is while you're still naked in bed together. That's a bad way to do it. Like, I guess you didn't have text messages in that day. I guess it would have had to be a letter. But also, like, that's a bad... Anthony, you can't do that. You've got to do it before the sex. You can't do it after. If you do it after, you've got to wait for a new day. Like, 
Oh, Anthony, that's a disaster. And basically, Sienna's kind of like, you told me that, like, you were going to look after me. Like, I don't, you know. And he basically says, like, you need to leave. He's a complete dick about it. And we're going to delve more into this. We really are. But, like, oh, Anthony. some shit <sighs> yeah that's some real shit um so we head, we head, we head to the, the last like setup of the episode I guess and this is truly where we're going to get to the point of this entire season because I guess like this episode is different from the first episode of season two in that like we had what, like maybe three new characters to introduce to us in season two. We've got, you know, like a lot. We need to know the whole setup of the show. So that doesn't really come until the very end of this season. But, you know, we kind of see Penelope's wall flowering around and Colin comes over her and she's really excited. And it's obvious. It's obvious that Colin sees her like as a bit of a friend and she's completely in love with him, which is a bit. I always think that's so sad to see. Like, I I kind of really hate this kind of unrequited love trope um, because it just makes me feel really bad for... That idiot in the background. It just makes me feel really bad for the person who's, like, been in love the whole time. Like, because they fell in love inst instantly. And I guess, like, it's really nice that, like, someone falls in love really slowly. That's beautiful for them. But I always think, like, it must fucking suck for the person who fell in love straight away, you know? Like... Just makes me feel really sad for them. In fact, I wrote a whole fic about that. Um, not about Penelope and Colin, I don't really. But I wrote it about um, Lucy and Gregory. But anyway, um, where was I? So, so um, Colin ends up kind of like doing the opposite of what he does every other time. And he kind of comes to Penelope's rescue a little bit because... Cressida is being really rude and he's kind of like, oh, well, I can't dance with you because I've already come in a dance with Penelope. And you can just tell this is the best night of Penelope's fucking life. Like, she's thrilled. So they go and dance. Simon's trying to get away from everyone. We see him escape the party as everyone's distracted by a whole lot of lights getting turned on, which I guess, like, seems ridiculous to us now, but it would have been very exciting in 1813, I suppose. Um... So, everyone, and Anthony kind of, he tells Daphne basically like, and you can tell, I think he's not super enthusiastic about this match either, but he's like, look, I can't find any reason to reject Neville, but uh, Neville, Neville's his brother. He doesn't exist in the show. Nigel Burbrook's um, proposal, like, and so you're going to marry him. And Daphne's kind of like, I'm not fucking getting married to that simpleton. See ya. So she pops off um, and she goes into the garden. She goes into the garden and it all gets very dramatic. I shouldn't laugh about this. Like it's actually could have ended really badly. But Nigel Burbrook comes in and he's really annoyed. And Daphne's kind of like, look, I'm not going to marry you. I don't know what Anthony told you, but like he was incorrect. I'm not going to marry you. And Nigel's pretty much like, you're going to marry me. He attacks her and she fends him off. She punches him, knocks him out cold. Simon, meanwhile, has heard this and he's run in a little bit too late, just finds him knocked down on the floor. And he's kind of like a little bit impressed. He's into it. He has never seen a woman knock out a man before. And he's like, I am very interested in this situation right now. Um, so he's then kind of joking about it. And Daphne's kind of like, well, I don't really have a choice. Like, he's like, you know... You're not gonna, you're not gonna marry him, basically. And she's like, you know what? Like, I'm gonna have to because I don't have any other options. Lady Whistledown's making my life a nightmare because she's told everyone that I don't have any options but this guy. So I'm gonna have to marry him now, basically. And Simon's kind of like, well, she's making my life a nightmare too. And then he, they come up with this plan essentially to trick everyone basically into and like baby girl you played yourself but like she they basically say like well we should just pretend that we formed an attachment because then the mums will leave me alone I'm gonna sneeze <coughs> I'm 
I'm so sorry. Um, the mums, the mums will leave me alone, and the men will kind of take a second look. Um, which is kind of a really sexist opinion, but like, it does work. But basically, he says it'll give Lady Whistle down something other to, to write about us, which is true. It does. So they decide that this is what they're going to do, and you can tell like there's already tension between them as they walk out. They just they do because Daphne seconds previously was like, I need to go. Like I can't be found here. I'm here in this garden alone with two men. Like I don't know what she thought everyone was going to think she'd done. That I was. I'm not entirely sure. But she, she essentially, she's like, well, I, I need to go. Um, so then she walks out from the garden with Simon a few seconds later, which is exactly what she was terrified to do previously. But again, um, they dance together and everyone's kind of like, Ooh. and that's our setup, I guess. It's a good first episode, like it's really intriguing I think, though I will say I think the first time I watched this series, the f after the first episode I was kind of like, oh, okay, but I was on holiday between Christmas and New Year and I was like, I don't have anything better to do with my life, so that's what I did. And by the end of episode two I was like, well, there now, actually I forgot something, I forgot something, oh gosh, I can't believe it. Um, we see that Marina has not had her period since she's been there, and okay, so I think Lady Featherington Portia says that it's been over a month. So I guess it's like, it's a month into the season at this point. And this is one thing about the show I will say. It moves a lot slower than the books. Like I think in all the books, like everyone's apart from, I think apart from like Francesca and Michael, Benedict and Sophie have a time jump, but I don't count that. And then, what's her face? Lucy, Lucy and Gregory. They are the only ones, but like basically everyone's story wraps up within like two weeks. Like I think when you think about it, like Anthony and Kate had met one another like three times before they got married. That's insane. Um, and like Daphne and Simon, even in the book, like don't really interact that much outside of, you know. Um, yeah, I think they, like, I think they probably love like three times and then they kiss and they're like, oh shit. Like, so, yeah, like, it's a really interesting setup to the show. I think, you know, obviously, there's a lot of, I think, issues with the writing in this season. And I think a few things that, like, I wish hadn't been put in there. I guess we'll talk about them as we go through. I'm not a huge fan of the Marina storyline, not because I don't like Marina, just because I think it's setting up for a lot of uncomfortable conversations that, like, we don't want to have later in the series. And not that I'm saying, like, we should never have uncomfortable conversations, not in that way. I mean, like, the fact that for, if they, if they want Eloise to end up with Philip, Marina has to die. So then this is a character that we've emotionally invested that you've just killed off for, you know, for, like, for what? And if they stick to the book in a really sad way, which I think like is particularly not great given some of the like issues that the actress, she has some mental health issues. So I think then having like killing off her character who has major de like depression, um, look, like I'm, I'm not sure it's very wise, just like the way that's gonna play out. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. Like I said, I'm not really in charge of the show. Um, so yeah, I guess we, next week, we're going to be getting a little bit more into episode two, obviously. I don't know why I felt the need to say that. We'll be doing episode two next week. Like I'm going to do them out of order. Um, I think, you know, this episode is a really interesting start sets up the premise pretty well it doesn't really leave you with a lot of unanswered questions but I guess that's gonna come through I think this season mostly I think it does a little it does a better job at peppering in B plots than season two did I think the B plot in season two felt very forced we obviously don't know what the to me at least um it wasn't one that I was particularly interested in in season two whereas I think maybe 
season one, I just found the B plots a little bit more compelling. And I, I enjoyed that we get a little bit more of Simon's backstory. If it was handled, I think a little poorly. We do, and a lot of it I can't speak to. I'm obviously not a person of color. I can't speak to the experience of watching the show as a person of color, but there are things that I think could have been handled better. And I, I'm not sure why they decided, like Simone actually said recently in an interview that there were scenes of like, flashbacks written for Kate. I'm not sure why they decided we then didn't need to see that, you know, um, but I, I enjoy, I guess where I'm going with that is I enjoy getting to learn more about Simon that way. Um, I think that's really well done this season. I think, yeah, it's a good start basically. There's a lot of things going on, but I'm going to wrap this up here because it's already gone on way longer than it should have for like, what I said, it, essentially nothing. I just fucked up my makeup. So yeah, I guess if you inexplicably want to hear me talk more about Bridgerton, you can find me on Tumblr at Newton Sheffield. I am primarily Kate Nanty based, I guess. I have written a lot of Kate Nanty fan fiction um, before and after the show came out. Find me on AO3 for that. Um, but yeah, have a good week. Thanks for getting ready with me and we'll see you next time. Bye.